welcome to the Antonov AN-225, also known as Maria, an aircraft that almost needs no introduction due to just what a legendary aircraft it's been. So what are we going to do today? We're going to take a look at the history of the AN-225, then we're going to go for a quick exterior view, have a look at all the details that are on the outside, come back onto the inside, take a look around the cargo hold, the flight deck, and then we're going to check out the EFB and some of the functions of how to load and unload the cargo on the Antonov 225. So without further ado, I can't wait to show you this aircraft. Let's get on with it. Let's talk about the history of Maria. She first flew in 1988, December of that year. So actually, it's a bit newer than I first thought. It's uh, to put it into perspective, it's newer than the A320. It's based on the AN-124, the Ruslan. Now, this was a great place to start. The Ruslan in itself uh, is a strategic heavy lift transport aircraft. But what they needed is they needed more capability. So they took the AN-124 as its base and expanded it in every single area. The key to Maria is big. Everything's big, everything's heavy, everything is so impressive. So it's got 640,000 kilos maximum takeoff weight, which is the heaviest in ever. 550,000 kilos maximum landing weight. That's crazy when you think about it. And it can take up to 255,000 kilos of payload, which is an all time world record not even close nothing comes even close to that the the second closest is over 120 tons less which just shows you this unique role that she played throughout her whole life fast forward a few years it's now 1994 and demand for maria is is just not there at that moment in time so she goes into long-term storage all six of her engines are removed and she sits there waiting to come back to life so it, that happens leading up to 2001, where the Antonov Design Bureau have found that they have had enough requests from customers that this niche of ultra heavy cargo cannot be filled by their AN-124, the Ruslan. So they bring her back to service with a fair few modifications. Now, unfortunately, things take a worse for Maria at this point. And in February 2022, she was heavily damaged at fighting at Antonov Airport and to this day still remains there, ready to be rebuilt. And this is where the project comes into play. Every single purchase of the Maria in Microsoft Flight Simulator, 100% of that money will go to the Antonov Design Bureau and will be set aside to rebuild what I will call now, and they're calling it as well, Maria 2. So it will be a rebuilt version of the original Maria. They have a fuselage, completely intact for a second AN-225 that was never finished and they're going to take the other parts from Maria, put them together and we will end up with Maria 2. Personally, I cannot wait for the day that she can take to the skies again because it's where she deserves to be. Now, let's take a look at the flight deck. First thing that strikes me about the flight deck is it is enormous. It's like a flying office. Um, I love it. Now, why are there so many seats and what does everybody do? Now, there are six permanent crew members, but of course, in the rear passenger area, there will be standby crew and other specialists that help. This is the flight crew. So we have a captain, first officer, an electrical engineer, an engineer, a navigator, and a radio operator. So having quite a few crew members in a cargo plane then wasn't that unusual. So that's where this sort of flight deck design and ethos comes from. So if we continue to look around the flight deck stations, on the main instrument panel, we've got quite, quite a clear view. I would say it's nicely designed. There's not much clutter going on. And we've got clearly some older analog instruments. We have a HSI and some other things that we're aware of and the autopilot panel at the top. Now, moving down to the pedestal, we've got the iconic six thrust levers. Now, there's not many jet aircraft in the world that have six thrust levers. But Maria does. So let's move back to the navigators panel. Now it's quite unique to have a navigator station in any aircraft in Microsoft Flight Simulator. So what have we got modeled here? 
So here you can set your frequencies for your VOR, ILS, your navigation aids. If we move to the left, it's probably the loneliest position in the plane. And as Demetrius said, often forgotten position, the radio operator. So pretty much self-explanatory, just do the radio. Let's move back to an extremely unique position, the electrical engineer panel. Now normally engineer and electrical engineer are combined, but they are separated on Maria. Now here, there's quite a lot of stuff that we can do. So we can power on all five batteries. You heard me right, five batteries. Normally Ruslan has four, but Maria has five. And if you leave these turned on, they will go flat. If you leave them on too long, they will actually overheat because they can't really run the aircraft for about more than 12, 15 minutes before they'll actually start overheating because it's running everything in here and it's a pretty big aeroplane. Now, let's move across to the engineer's panel. Now in the engineer's panel, we have all of the fuel pumps in front of us, all of the engine gauges, but by far the strangest place is this sort of 90 degree panel. Now this is unique to Maria and it comes down to an interesting sort of design philosophy that went on. Because they knew they were only building one or maybe two, the idea was to try and keep as much commonality between Ruslan and Maria, which makes complete sense. But sometimes you run out of space. When you need six of everything, not four of everything, then you end up with no space left. So you created this little kickout panel. Now moving back to the front of the flight deck again, let's take a look at the navigation system. So we have installed the working title Garmin GNS 530. Maria did not have this installed, but there were Ruslan aircraft that actually had Garmin uh, 430s, I believe, retrofitted into the navigations panel. So it's not an undue modification, but it does make life quite a bit easier in terms of integration because we're obviously able to load routes from the world map and have all the fantastic work that the working title team have done integrated into Maria. You can still, of course, uh, track a radial, a VOR, manual navigation, that's still still possible. But you can also use this GPS unit if you so wish. So let's move to the back of the aircraft. This is more of a transit slash rest area. Here we've got some bench seats and these will pull down to be beds so other crew members can rest on long flights because the aircraft can actually fly up to 12, 15 hours if needed. So if it's empty with full tanks. At the front here, we've got the emergency exit. This is actually a uh, raft, I believe, that can carry up to something like 20 or 30 people. It must be a very big raft. And on the other side there, we have a window, which we can just about see out of the wing. It's quite difficult to see there. Now, this is the end of the pressurization section of the aircraft. This is why this door is looks kind of like a big fridge door, because the cargo area is not pressurized. So let's move down the ladder into there now. So here we are in the cargo area. We've fully modeled this inside Microsoft Flight Simulator with the ladder that goes up to the flight deck. We've got the tow bar here. We take this with us on all of our flights because the aircraft is so unique that no one's got a, a, a tow bar for Ruslan or Maria. So you have to take it with you. And you also have got the overhead crane here, which was designed to pick up payload and take it down the plane if needed. Very self-sufficient aircraft. As you can see, this is enormous area. Now I'm gonna put my camera down to actual head height to try and give you an idea here. And it's just huge. Uh, I mean, it goes on and on and on. And we have this solid titanium floor bringing us all the way back, back to the rear curtain here. So now let's go to the exterior of Maria and take a look around. With an aircraft this impressive, where do you even start? We have tried to put a lot of detail into the exterior modeling here with no matter how close you get you really shouldn't see a degradation in quality we've got all of the probes and all of the markings all over the aircraft here at the front there's even these little radiation symbols i believe that's to do with the weather radar and things below that but i'm not 100 percent sure but they're all there as per the real aircraft moving across to the wing we've got the six engines here they are Motosic D18T engines, they produce around 51,000 pounds of thrust each, which is pretty impressive actually, in fact it's very impressive. They are equivalent to say a Trent 500 Rolls-Royce engine or a CF6, a higher end one of those. But there's six of them, so that's pretty amazing. Now, when we look at the wing, very unique wing. Two interesting things about it. First of all, it's an anhedral wing, which is fairly unusual for jet aircraft 
So what does that mean? It means it's pointing downwards. I think it's around five or six degrees, something like that, that it actually slopes down. And that's why in flight, it kind of bends up again, almost level. So it's kind of interesting. That's done for various stability reasons, but we won't get into that now. The other one is, if we take a look at the top of the wing, you might notice that the slats don't go all the way along the front. You think, why is that? There's a good reason for it. The reason is, remember we talked about commonality. Now, this little section here, with the bit that pokes out, is the new part for Maria. Now, what they did is they put the extra engine on that, and then they put an, a Ruslan's wing on the end here. So this section here is the same as one from a Ruslan, which makes sense, right? Because it's the same parts, it's already been made, it does its job perfectly. So they reused aspects of it, and that's why the slats don't go all the way. And that's why these two engines are spaced symmetrically, and this one isn't. So, fun fact for you. Moving around to the landing gear, you might think, why is there so many? I mean, it's impressive, but why are there so many? Now, the reason is to spread the weight out. This is the same for the nose wheel as well, where we have two of them. Now, airports all around the world use a thing called a PCN rating, which is basically how much weight can this piece of concrete or tarmac or whatever take per area? Now, think about it. We've got 640,000 kilos, and if we spread that over a bigger area, we can taxi on some of these airports. Whereas otherwise, we wouldn't have. These rear three wheels here steer um, the opposite way to the nose wheel to allow tight maneuverability on the ground. Obviously, it's not going to be a Cessna on the ground. It's still the world's biggest aeroplane, but it's actually pretty maneuverable. I really mean that. And we have that all set up in the flight model, so we actually have proper rear wheel steering. So next to the, the wheels here, we have each APU. So one on the left and one on the right. They are TA-12 APUs with the intake and outlets quite close to each other. A bit unusual to have two APUs. Remember I told you everything on the rear is bigger, so that's <laughs> following that trend. If we move a bit further back, we've got two fins on the end of the horizontal stabilizer, which is pretty interesting. Normally on Ruslan, you have a central fin. The reason we don't have here is for taking payloads on top of the aircraft, so there's room for them, and it doesn't disturb the airflow to the fins. Pretty clever design. On the right hand side of the plane, pretty much the same as the left side. So what we're gonna do now, we're gonna hop inside and we're gonna look at the EFB and open the main cargo door and take a look at that kneeling animation. Okay, so you join me at the EFB inside the 225. Now let's take a look at how we do this kneeling process. So we go onto the ground tab and we first select main door. Now below we have these selectors now what these do is they show you sort of the progress of the animation and of the actual kneeling process. This is more useful when it's in the realistic mode because it takes a lot longer. How do we get to that mode? Well, we can go on the options tab and currently it's set to fast. So it takes about a minute, 60 seconds. And on the realistic option, it takes around about four to five minutes, something like that. And you can keep a track of what's going on here. So first of all, the door is going to open, as we can see now. Then the legs are going to come down. Then the aircraft will kneel and then the ramp will open out. So let's take a look at that from the outside. So here you can see the little legs are coming down. Now, what are these for? Well, what they do is they're going to support the weight of the aircraft when this nose gear is lifted up. Now, the lifting up of the nose gear is pretty complicated and it's one of the only aircraft in the world that actually has the ability to do this especially given the weight and the scale of the aircraft so shortly we should hear the hydraulic pump click on for this process there it goes it's quite a unique sound and now the wheel starts to move forward but now you will notice the aircraft is actually tilting we've been able to actually get the aircraft to kneel so if you keep an eye on it you can see it now going down so we can also have a look at this if we check out the landing gear. So, you know, remember we had all those different landing gear struts. And now if we take a look at them, can you see how the forward one right at the front is getting more and more and more compressed? And the rearmost one is going up, so it's getting less compressed. And you can see this by looking how much of that silver you can see of the oleo strut. So, Shortly, we should see the process finish. So it's about here when the main legs touch down and now the front ramp is going to open because the aircraft wheels are not taking any of the load. I might hear you add, what's the point? Why would you want to do this in the first place? 
Well, there's a few good reasons. First reason is, at a remote destination, it really means that you don't need much, if any, equipment to unload and load the aircraft. You can even bring inside the aircraft uh, a truck or a forklift with you and take the containers out. They can easily drive up and down this ramp here. Now, that comes to my second point. It's called approach angle, which is just the angle that you come at the aircraft to unload and load cargo. It makes it, well, take a look. It's pretty shallow. You know, it's quite easy to drive a vehicle up here and not sort of scrape the bottom out. And now you've got a very, very easy platform for loading and unloading cargo. So after the aircraft's in this knelt position, we can choose cargo to load. Now we have quite a few options. Truck, we have two fire trucks, we have a maglev train, three helicopters, a boiler, and back onto the cargo options, which will be populated if you have your own cargo set. Now the boiler is by far the heaviest payload, it's about 183 tonnes, and these cut loads here, most of them were taken by Maria for real flights, which you can replicate. And once you load them, the actual weight of those loads go into the aircraft without you having to do anything other than click load the cargo. And they will stay with you throughout the whole flight. So you can actually check on them, arrive, open the door, and it will be with you when you get there. A really cool feature, I think. So now let's jump into a very quick takeoff where we're going to wrap up the video. Okay, so here we are, ready for takeoff. First of all, we're going to talk a little bit about how the aircraft feels on rotation, some of the unique characteristics about it. Every takeoff is done with flaps full. That's kind of strange, uh, even for large transport category aircraft. Uh, so it really doesn't need much of a rotation to get going. Now, if you've watched enough videos of the uh, 225, you will have noticed that it kind of tends to sometimes slowly lift itself off the ground and the nose wheel sometimes rises very, very slowly and then it takes off. Now, I think this comes from the fact that the rotation at the end is kind of because it got so much lift from the flaps that it's kind of lifting itself off. That's the best way that I can describe it. So we're going to try and show you what that looks like now in Microsoft Flight Simulator. So we're quite heavy. Uh, we're about 520,000 kilos, something, something like that. So it's going to be a pretty... Uh, pretty heavyweight takeoff. So what we're going to do is we've done our engine warm-up before we got onto the runway here so we're good to go to 40% and then just straight across to full power. Hopefully I was able to line the aircraft up reasonably okay. So that looks okay. So we're going to bring some of the thrust up now. safety catch catch release and the gear goes into the up position We're waiting for that now so thank you very much for watching this welcome to the 225 video i hope you found it interesting also just to get you a little bit of an insight of how incredible this machine is and how it's going to be absolutely amazing for everyone to be able to experience that feeling of flight again in one of the most unique aircraft ever made so thank you very much for watching i do hope you enjoyed the video